So as we go through this lesson, think about a time in your life when Jesus, his words really changed you and helped you be uh, the person that you needed to be. You know, if we could call up anyone in the Old Testament, I would like to bring uh, to stand beside me Moses. And then from the New Testament, Peter, James, and John, those would be some, some good individuals to bring up and ask them about their experiences with God. Um, I think that would be just incredible to hear what they have to say about their the time spent with God as they, as they would see it. And if we could ask them about their interaction with God on the Mount of Transfiguration, because all of these individuals were there. They were all there. I think that would be a, a great thing to do. I'm sure we would hear them talk about how important Jesus is, because that's what that whole event really was about. I'm sure that we would hear them talk about how God cares for mankind. And we really need to know that today, don't we? Every single person on the planet God loves and cares for. He wants them to be his. He wants them to belong to him through his son. And so this event is all about how important Jesus is. And so in our world today, we need to know that Jesus is still that important. He's still uh, to be number one, so to speak, in our minds and in our hearts. And God does care for mankind because he sent Jesus. And he didn't just care for them in the first century. He cares for mankind in 2020 and beyond. He surely does. And there's nothing new under the sun, Scripture says. So there's nothing that human beings could do that would be surprising to God, I don't believe. I think God has seen it all and God understands it all. He knows the true motivation for things. And so what mankind really needs to understand is what's going on here, the Mount of Transfiguration, that Jesus, Jesus is the one that we need to listen to. Not our feelings. Uh, Jesus is the one we need to listen to. And we need to make appropriate adjustments. So, I think they would engage us in conversation if they were here today. I think they would engage us in conversation about Jesus. And what if the question came up, how has Jesus changed your life? I mean, what if Moses or Elijah or Peter, James or John ask you today? How? I'm just curious. You know, we lived way back then and, and this is how God changed our life. This is how... God, through Jesus, changed, changed our lives. And we were there on that Mount of Transfiguration and got to see what happened. We were talking with Jesus and all of that. We understand all this. I'm just curious. How has Jesus changed your life? What would you say? What would you say? An interesting thing happens here <clears throat> on the mountain this Mount of Transfiguration or this Mountain of Change, you might say. So Moses is there along with Elijah. They're talking with Jesus about his death, about his departure is what Scripture says. And what's revealed through this encounter is that Jesus is most important. You have the law and the prophets represented here by Moses and Elijah, of course, in the book of Hebrews, it tells us that the sacrifice of Jesus, what God did through Jesus is a better deal than what happened through Moses or with Moses, right? Jesus is the fulfillment. He, he lived up to the law. He fulfilled the law. And so Jesus is better. It's what God is telling us in, in Hebrews. And this is exactly what John the Baptist says. You remember when, when he was uh, talking in the Gospels, he says that Jesus must increase, but I must decrease. That's exactly right. So let's set the stage. Here's the stage. Jesus is preparing his disciples for his departure. He's going to leave them physically. He's not going to be with them anymore. 
And in Matthew chapter 16, we see Jesus asking this question, who do, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who do people say that I am? And Peter answers, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus talks about his death, his resurrection. And Peter rebukes him. Peter says, never, Lord. This is not going to happen, in other words. Kind of a, over my dead body will this happen. Kind of a statement. Never is this going to happen. Well, you have in mind the things of man, not God, is what Jesus tells Peter. So Peter gets told here, this is the way it's going to be. This is the way God wants it to be. So sometimes the way we think things should be are not the way they should be. Sometimes the way we handle things isn't the way God wants us to handle things. So we have to be careful in how we deal with people. You know, when we go out into nature, usually uh, we don't run into, you know, difficulty with, uh, I mean, the animals don't give us a hard time about what politics or anything like that. I mean, they don't discuss about uh, your, you know, your latest goings on. The, I mean, people go out into nature and they say, I enjoy it so much. I, it's almost as if God was there. Well, he's everywhere. But what they're saying is there were no people to contend with. It's these pesky people, right? That we have to deal with. And sometimes, sometimes we're not on our, we're not hitting on all cylinders. We're not doing the best we can do. And so sometimes we miss the mark. In other words, we miss being like Jesus. Maybe there's an opportunity. So. Jesus is saying to Peter, you're not thinking like God. You're thinking like a human being would think. Because Peter really wants Jesus to stay around and, and we would too. You know, if we had seen what we what he had seen and we understood that. OK, he's talking about the kingdom and, the, and he's going to be the king. And this is going to be great because I'm really in good with the king. It's a good thing to be in good with the king. Because most likely bad things won't happen to you, right? And so here he is thinking all these things. And Jesus says, you're, you're thinking like a man. You're not thinking like God. And he says, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, he must, must, must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. That's what needs to take place. So he lets them know that some of them would be alive to see the kingdom of God come into existence with power. He lets them know that as Jesus begins to prep the disciples for his death, the highlight of all of it is this transfiguration on the mountain. And so let's think about the encounter. I'm going to read sort of a harmony of the account. The account is found in Matthew 17, Mark chapter 9, or Luke chapter 9. You can pick one of those. But what I'm going to do is read the account with these three uh, telling of the, the tellings of the story sort of blended together. So about eight days after Jesus said this, he took with him Peter, James and John, the brother of James. And led them up a high mountain by themselves to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became dazzling white, as bright as a flash of lightning, whiter than any in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy. 
But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing there with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it's good for us to be here. So they're all a little sleepy. You know how it is. You're trying to stay awake. But then when they be, he becomes fully awake, he sees what's going on. And, and, he, and he, he, he says, Master, um, it's good for us to be here. This is great. Wouldn't it be great? I mean, how many people get to see Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus and Jesus is just glowing? That's not an everyday occurrence, you see. And so Peter realizes when he is fully awake, this is a great, great moment for us. So let us build three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And the scripture says he didn't know what to say. He was so frightened. So he just blurts this out. He was afraid. And so this is what he says. While he was still speaking. So what else did he say? We don't know. Was this the extent of it? Maybe. But here he is talking while he's still speaking. A bright cloud appeared and enveloped them. And they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved. So what you have here is God basically saying to Peter, shh, shh, just shh, shh, shh. Right? Don't. Shh. And this is what's taking place. God speaks from the cloud. How awesome is that? God speaks. And here they are. God says, this is my beloved son. Now, he's already said this. Do you remember when? When Jesus was baptized, right? Right? He splits the clouds and God speaks and he's doing it again. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my beloved son whom I have chosen. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. I want you to listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. I love this scene. Here they are, Peter speaking. All of a sudden, there's a cloud and God speaks and they hit the dirt, right? As would we. So they're face down. Peter, James, and John, face down, right? And Jesus comes up and he touches them. And he says, get up. Don't be afraid. This isn't something that should frighten you. A big event. I mean, when God speaks from a cloud and everyone's glowing, well, Jesus is glowing and everyone else is, is uh, glowing in his presence. It's a pretty big event. They're afraid. And suddenly they looked around and they no longer saw anyone except Jesus with them. Again, what's revealed on this mountain is that everything comes through Jesus. Jesus is the most important. And not long after this event, well, God instructs Peter, James and John to listen. From the cloud and they get the point. And they come down from the mountain. And as it often does, life happens. <laughs> they're, they're, they're leaving this experience that they've had. And they're coming down the mountain. And they come down the mountain to find others arguing they're involved in an argument with the teachers of the law. 
So this is what they come back to. And not long after that, they're going to be arguing among themselves about their rank in the kingdom. In other words, it's time to be in the valley again. We're not on the mountain anymore. We're down among the people where they live. We're down in the dirt. Isn't that the way it is sometimes? It's sort of where we live. I mean, we can be hitting on all cylinders. We're doing great. We're thinking this is going to be a great day, maybe possibly the best day I've ever had. I, I've, I've prayed already. Maybe I've read scripture. I mean, this is going to be the best day ever, but we haven't yet put our feet on the floor. We're still in bed. And when we get up, we go to work or we go to school or wherever we might go. And we realize people. People aren't talking about Jesus. People may not even care that you're a Christian. They don't care. So what happens? Life happens. We get down in the dirt. It's time in the valley, not on the mountain. We were doing well. And then we woke up. Or we were doing well, and then our feet hit the floor. We were doing well. We were driving along in our car and things were going great. We had a great mental attitude. Our focus was on Christ. And then we hit the traffic jam. And it all falls apart. Why is this person going so slow? Beep, beep, you know. What is wrong? Can't people just merge? I mean, can't we just do that zipper? Thing that everyone try no no it will never work on earth ever anywhere the merge lanes are always going to be chaotic why because everybody has a choice and your choice just a few moments ago was i'm going to be like jesus today and then you find yourself am i talking to the right group i mean you find yourself so frustrated not with nature but with people people and Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. He loved these people? Yes. So sometimes we need to allow Jesus to transform us, to change our minds, to help us be what we need to be. Because it's where we live, in the valley. You don't live on top of the mountain all the time. So Peter would reflect on this experience that he had on the Mount of Transfiguration later on in his life. As he writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 19, he says, We do not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Now, this is what he's talking about, this event. For we received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my son whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. We ourselves, Peter says, we ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain. He's talking about that event. And we have heard or we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place. Peter says you, you would do well to listen up. To hear what's being said. So listen to Jesus and pay attention to his word. You say that's so simple. And it really is until we're involved with other people <laughs> and we get tested and and things go awry. Maybe I'm thankful that God allows us to practice this. You say practice this. What are you talking about? Well, I, I'm glad that that God still works with us. And allows us to, to, uh, 
to mix and mingle with the population. And we get to practice being like Jesus. We get to practice living his word. We get to practice listening to Jesus and paying attention to his word and then living that out. And so you thought you've been thinking about a situation where God had worked on you, so to speak, sort of changed your mind, maybe changed your attitude, your actions, and you behave differently in that setting because of Jesus. So you have that in your mind, hopefully. I want to tell you um, about something that helped me. Uh, this time of transformation for me. It was around this time of year, around the 4th of July. And we were in a certain place. I won't tell you the town or the name of the hospital. <laughs> Say hospital? Yes, there's a hospital involved in this story. We, around the 4th of July, we were watching fireworks. And my lovely wife just had some extreme pain, which we came to find out it was her gallbladder and she needed that removed. And some of you have had the same experience. And maybe some of you are suffering through that right now. But we were there to watch fireworks and we did until we didn't, <laughs> until we couldn't. So we go back to the motel room. It was me, my wife and our youngest daughter. We were all three there together watching the fireworks back at the hotel. We leave our youngest daughter there who wasn't, I mean, she was old enough to be left there. All right. Not leaving a three-year-old in the, in the uh, motel room. So she's old enough to be left on her own. So I take my wife to the hospital, take her to the hospital. And we get there and, you know, she gets checked in. She's in one of the rooms and she's in a lot of pain and they're, they're taking her vitals. They're doing all the, all these things and, and uh, they're checking to make sure it's not her heart. And while they're doing all this, this was about midnight. It wasn't until about 2 a.m. that they finally got back to her. Okay. I'm not a happy camper at 12.01 all the way probably till about one o'clock or so. But in comes someone that had, um, I found out they had, they had overdosed. And so I could see what's going on in the, in the room across the hallway. I could see it all and hear it all. And everyone sort of left Lee. I mean, this was early, early in the morning, not a whole lot going on in the hospital until there is, right? And so here's Lee in pain and they bring in this, this person, this fellow that had overdosed. And I'm thinking, my wife's in pain. What? When I begin to listen to what's going on over here, it was sort of chaotic for a while. I think the guy coded maybe more than once. And I'm, I'm there listening to all this and I'm not really that happy that no one is... Now, we don't know it's her gallbladder at this point. We have no idea. You know, if they'd walked in and said, well, it's your gallbladder, we're going to take it out here in about 20 minutes or so. Okay, but we still have no idea. She's writhing in pain. And I am standing there at the doorway of her room, watching what's going on over here in this other room. And I'm not very happy. Matter of fact, I'm really not happy. Now, it's not that I don't want the other person to be tended to, but my wife's in pain. You're with me, right? You do understand what I'm saying. My wife is in pain. I want her to be taken care of here. Well, after a while and listening to the situation over here, I began to pray. <laughs> Wouldn't that have been great had I done that in the first place? I mean, I'm pretty human if you, if you haven't realized. And I was, and I said what was on my mind, oh, probably would have been thrown out of the hospital. Just to be honest with you. I mean, it wouldn't have been vulgar, but it wouldn't have been pleasant for anyone to hear. Because my wife's in pain. 
So I prayed. And as I prayed, I asked God to, to just, what do I need to do in this situation? Is there something I can do? And I'm thinking, what can you do as I'm praying this prayer? And I get done with the prayer and I'm thinking, huh, I'll just walk over here. So I walked over to the, to the guy's room and he's, he's there in bed and the, the team is around him and his, his wife is there and um, things had calmed down a little bit. And they all look at me because there was a little opening there in the curtain and I'm standing there in that opening. And they look at me like, who in the world are you? And these words came out of my mouth. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Jesus can change you in to what you need to be. Okay. These words came out of my mouth. I'm a minister and I'm here to pray for him. And I hear myself saying this, and Lee's still over in the other room, writhing in pain. And so I walked up and I took the man's hand, took his wife's hand, and I led a prayer for him. Now, I'm not patting myself on the back. I'm just saying this. The only one that, the one that's a hero in this story is Jesus, because he got my attention. God got my attention. He said, I want you to listen to him. I want you to listen to my son and I want you to go be like him. And so it was a better evening. And I told them, I said, if you need me for anything, I don't know what it might be. Here's my card. You can call me anytime, day or night, and I'll come to where you are. We can talk, we can study the Bible, whatever you want. If you want me to pray, I'm really no one, but Jesus is really something. <laughs> and that's why I'm here. You just showed up here. I mean, how did you know? I said, well, my wife's in, in the room over here. And uh, but I overheard everything and I thought. Maybe this might be a good thing to do. No, it was a great thing to do. So has God ever gotten your attention? Has he ever changed your mind about something? Sort of transformed the way you're thinking. And, and then you begin to listen to the word of God. You listen to his son. And the outcome is different because you've listened to Jesus. And you've behaved like him. I'm going to tell you. Peter retells this story about this mountain experience with Jesus. He retells it in his writing. And I'm going to tell you this. It's good for us to retell stories where we were thinking like this and it's not so good, but then God gets a hold of us. We remember a scripture or we begin to pray, whatever it might be. And he helps us see what we need to do in that moment. And it always ends up being a better thing. Peter said, it was good to be there. And you need to pay attention to this. So I'm telling you this story. Sort of ashamed at what I was thinking and how I was behaving in my mind that night until I prayed. So I want to encourage you, when you face situations and you face people that aren't bringing out the best in you. I'm telling you this. God will always bring out the best in you if you let him. He sure will. So if you're a Christian, you're partnered with Jesus already. And so you have Christ living in you. It's what Paul says. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But he lives in me. It makes all the difference in the world. And so we walk around with Jesus and the situations are endless, it seems, in our world, right? I mean, look, we're poised to be able to share with people the goodness of Jesus and help point them in a better direction. But that'll never happen if we keep our old mindset, if we don't allow God to do his work. We have great potential to be bitter, to be angry, 
to be people that are of no use to the world except throwing more gasoline and lighting more matches. And God says, I love this world. I gave my son. If you're in Christ, let him change your attitude. Let him change your mind. Let him transform you into a better you. Because you plus Jesus is a great thing. So when Peter, James, and John were on the mountain, they were really, really sleepy. You remember that. And when they became fully awake, they, it's scripture says they saw his glory when they became fully awake. I think we should be awake in all settings, don't you? I mean, we should really be fully awake in all settings. And when we are, he shines through us and he changes us. So I hope today that you'll give Jesus some consideration if you haven't already. That you'll take a hard look at what God is doing through him for you. If you're not in Christ, God put Jesus on a cross so that you could be saved. Put all of your sin on him. And so what do we do? Well, we do whatever God says, how we need to respond to that sacrifice. So if you see Jesus and you understand you need your sins forgiven, repent of your sins. Confess Jesus as the new leader of your life. It's no longer you anymore. And be buried with him in baptism. Ananias tells Saul, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on his name. You know, God offers that through the blood of Jesus. It's a great thing to pillow your head at night and know Satan has no hold on you and God has you in his hand. Seek Jesus in all settings and let him change you.